that, I hate following Sue Deer. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. We're so excited to be kicking off our second annual AIN Action Vegas. And for those that were here both years, thank you for, for coming back. I was really stoked when I was asked to kick this off, but I was also honestly a little stumped, right? How do I get you guys as ex excited as that? How do I explain what we're going to have coming in terms of how to make AI real? Right? or how to use AI, how to differentiate with AI, how to get real outcomes, right? So there's a lot I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to start. So I actually called Sudhir, and I said, Sudhir, how would you do this, this presentation? But I think most of you guys know Sudhir has like no opinions on anything. So it didn't get me anywhere. I was, I, I, was, I was lost. So I called Bob Friday, our chief AI officer, and you guys know this. Engineering is from Venus, marketing is from Mars. Didn't really understand what the hell he was talking about either. So hopefully yeah, you guys can understand him later. So, but then I realized, you mentioned sheriff in town. There is actually a new sheriff in town that's better than all of us. So I actually booted up my computer, and I asked ChatGPT, how the hell would you do this thing if, you know, if you were in my shoes? And I actually had some pretty good advice. You know, the first thing it said is start with a thought-provoking stat. OK, you know, that's like presentation 101. So let's, let's OK, ChatGPT, overlord. What do you got for us here? What's a good stat? So $11 billion. In two years, AI ops will be $11 billion market with a 25% CAGR. That's pretty cool, but I'm guessing you guys probably don't care about stats, and you probably already know AI ops is crushing it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be at AI in Action Vegas to learn more about AI ops. So come on, ChatGPT, you got to give us something a little bit more than that. All right, cool. Share a personal story. I like that. I can do that. Um, the one that immediately it comes to mind, which you're also going to hear from, from Tom Wilburn as well, so I'll touch on the personal experience of this, is the founding of MIST, right? MIST was actually founded back in 2014 to transition the industry from network experiences to user experiences, right? And that's what you're going to hear a lot about throughout the course of the day. Um, and again, Tom will walk you through that journey a little bit more. But there's one story that actually really stuck with me when I joined MIST about a year or two after they, they had first started. And we were working with one of the, the Fortune 10 retailers who's actually in, in the room right now. And they actually were telling a story about robots, believe it or not. That was their user for experience, robots. And their robots were going around their warehouses and fulfillment centers and doing what robots do. And the problem is if one of those robots went down, it's millions of dollars lost every minute it was down. And they had a great line, robots can't call for help. The robot's not going to pick up the phone and call your help desk and say the Wi-Fi sucks, right? So in that instance, it was a great example of you have to really hone in on user experiences and optimize the network for that. So I love that example, right? Or another way to put it is, as IT guys, you got to be able to take the blinders off and tr transition from looking at just that, the fact that the APs are up and running or the network's up and running to how are the users on that network having an experience. Here's a funny example of that. That's strange. A ton of Wi-Fi service tickets just rolled in, but I can't see any network issues. Well, the light's on, so it must be fine. They're saying the Wi-Fi sucks. But the light is on. As, as that was an example of some of the ads that we run, again, to get people to focus on the fact that AI is real, delivering real value, and focusing on user experiences. So thanks, ChatGPT. I think we got in a good direction there. Um, what else? This is the last, last uh, recommendation that ChatGPT had, is pose a question or, or, or challenge the audience. And actually, I thought this one was really interesting, right? There's so many questions you can go down, like, is it real or how do I trust it, et cetera. But I thought the more interesting question right now for us to talk about in my setup, and, and again, folks will, will, will double click on that, is why now? What's happening right now, right? Why is it that all of a sudden, LLM, GPT, AI is on everyone's tongues right now. Why are there that kids in Little League are coding against open AI and grandmothers in Safeway actually are talking about AI? So what, what happened recently that changed things so dramatically? So for those that don't know, ChatGPT is generative pre-trained transformer. So what that means is you're basically creating a large language model of a lot of data moving into a system using deep learning where I can actually prompt it and get real human answers back. That's the marketing definition of this. That's the best you're going to get from me. But the general concept here is it's very easy to use. It's very creative. has a whole host of internet data that it can pull from. So you can do some really cool things. Like, for example, hypothetically, I may have sent my wife a Valentine's Day card written by Tupac Shakur. She appreciated it. She works in AI, loves Tupac. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but that was an example where ChatGPT hooked me up, right? Or here's another example, right? I asked ChatGPT, Write a haiku about AI, because I know you guys are all into poetry, right? So should I take my shoes off for this one, Sudhir, because it's so zen, right? Artificial mind, 
learning, evolving, growing, future at your door. That's Zen as shit, right? Come on. <laughs> Chat GPT, all right. Good stuff. Um, but seriously, you know, there is a difference in what LLM can provide and VNA. And actually, LLM is an augmentation to the right software architecture, the right virtual network assistant. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about, right? So while an LLM is great for certain use cases, it actually is only, um, it's hard to validate the answers. Is it accurate? Is it not accurate? And it's a snapshot in time, right? It's a, it's a specific thing. So if you want to ask, you know, what is wrong with my network today, right? Or what was wrong with Jeff's laptop yesterday? Or show me all unhappy users. You're not going to be able to do that. You need a virtual AI-driven assistant like Juniper's Marvis. I heard I was going to be punked. <laughs> there you go. Marvis, meet Marvis, also known as Mike Bouchon. He'll be here all night. Remember to tip your waiters. Uh, but in all seriousness, you know, Marvis, our VNA, uh, leveraged a whole host of AI driven technologies. You know, whether it's you know, natural language processing, anomaly detection, event correlation, there's a lot you can do with a, a VNA. But I think if you guys were down the road at Cisco, if you're at Aruba Atmosphere, you've probably heard a boatload of buzzwords, right? All those words I just mentioned are probably words that you've heard before. So if there's anything that you walk away from my presentation is that there's five things that are needed in an AI Ops VNA solution that really make it real. And again, you're going to hear these reinforced by our customers, by Bob, by Sudhir, by Tom, as we go down the path. But the first thing is data. Bad data in, bad data out. You need the right data to build an AI model. And again, that's why back in the days when, when Bob and Sujay Hagela created Juniper, they rewrote the control plane to collect 150 user states. That's why Juniper acquired MIST, because now you can bring in telemetry data from routers, from switches, from firewalls to complete the picture. So it's all about not just the quantity of the data, but the quality of the data. Okay. Secondly, that has to go somewhere where you can process it. I am sorry, with all due respect to the guys that rhyme with MISCO, you cannot do AI on premises. That's not how Amazon does it. That's not how Google does it. That's not how you know, the world of AI does it. You need a modern microservices cloud for agility, for scale, resiliency. That's what we built from scratch. That's what the whole Juniper portfolio is leveraging together in a unified front. You need rich data science. I was standing up just like this at an event not too long ago, a field day event. And I said, we were the first to do AI-driven operations, the first to do AI-driven IT. And someone chimed in and said, does being first really matter? You know, we hear vendors say that all the time. And my answer is, with AI, yeah, it actually does, right? Because the algorithms get better. There's less false positives. You had more algorithms to do things like service levels or find persistently failing clients. So actually having a seventh generation AI algorithm that you can now add things like LLN on top of it absolutely matters. And that's one of the things that we've done. The fourth pillar is continuous learning. Again, Bob Friday, compliments to him, always says this, if you want to understand if your vendor is using real AI, ask them where their support organization sits with respect to their data science engineers. Are they taking the information back from customers like these guys and putting it back into the system to learn better? That's what Juniper's doing, that's continuous learning, pulling in data from applications like Zoom, that's how you build a real VNA. And then lastly, we kind of talked about this, the full stack portfolio. You can't do AI in a silo. If a Teams call goes down, is it the wireless? Is it the wired? Is it the WAN? Is it, is it Teams? Is it the cloud? You need the ability to correlate all that information and do it under full stack portfolio. So, so those are some of the requirements of a VNA. I think what goes into a VNA, though, may be less interesting than what comes out of a VNA, right? What are the actual outcomes? And again, we're going to talk a lot about that through this show. Whether it's you know, just lower cost savings through better OPEX, whether it's just better patient experiences when someone shows up at a VA hospital, whether it's better student experience like the folks at Dartmouth who just don't want people tweeting that the Wi-Fi in the dorm room sucks and I can't get at, at my Xbox running, right? So there's a variety of different reasons that you want to leverage a VNA and an AOPS to deliver better business outcomes, and they're all here. And you're going to hear from this more. Tom's going to drill into this as well as the customers. And also, an interesting one is about sustainability, right? If the Gap can reduce 85% of their truck rolls to their stores, that saves not only IT time, but that saves gas and emissions, right? Our, our friends at ServiceNow, right? If they can eliminate, which they did, 128,000 metric tons of their carbon footprint, that's not shabby, right? And that's what comes from, again, being able to do more automation and more insight um, from your network. So 
enough with ChatGPT. We have lots of human experts here to, to talk about that. As we said, we got uh, Sudhir mentioned, we got ServiceNow, we got University of Washington, HEB, RADI, Children's, uh, Lawballs, Granted, talk about all the different ways that they're deploying it and using it within their networks. We got Tom Wilburn and Sudhir Mata, head of sales, head of products for the AI Driven Enterprise. They're going to talk about the campus branch. We got my good friend, Bouchang, Mike Bouchang, who your time will come up, just wait. Um, he's going to talk about data center. And we got Kate Adam to talk about security. So with all due respect, ChatGPT, we're done with you. <laughs> really? All right. We don't need AI-driven photos. I think we're good. So with that, you know, Tom, why don't we get you on stage, or should I say Anderson Cooper? Because AI, I think, makes you think, thinks you look like Anderson Cooper, no? Who thinks Bob looks like Anderson Cooper in that picture? There you go. All right. Or Tom, Bob, Tom, not Bob, sorry. So Tom, come on up stage. <laughs> 